Welcome to Smithville Baptist Church with Pastor Terry Alford. People often wonder, how can I know Jesus? You find him here in the Bible. Did you know that in the Bible there are over 7,000 promises by God just for you? I want to encourage you to open this Bible and make those promises as your own. Therefore, submit to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. Now let's check out today's message. Well, Father God, I thank you for your word today, and I, and I thank you, Lord God, that you are going to just preach this word, Lord. It's your Holy Spirit that speaks through us. God, we can't do anything on our own, or we can try, but we're not successful without you, Lord God. We need you, Holy Spirit, to fill us which you have, and we need you, Holy Spirit, to flow through us, which you do. And Lord God, I pray that you would minister to the hearts and the lives of the people that hear this message and those that are in this place today. God, I do lift up those that are not with us today for whatever reason, Lord God, and I pray a great blessing on them. And I pray, God, that uh, you would uh, bring them back to us next week, and we thank you for that in Jesus' name. Amen. I'm going to share from 2 Corinthians chapter 3. And I, you know, it's kind of funny because it seems like I just did this a couple weeks ago. And maybe I did, but I don't think I had the same message as I had a couple weeks ago, but it was the same text. And so we're going to see some. But I find it interesting. Paul's writing this letter. This is the second letter to the Corinthians. And in it, the first letter, if you recall, he, one of the things he had to do is he had to uh, defend himself. He was constantly defending himself because there's so many people out there that were, uh, for various reasons, other like, like envy, jealousy, uh, hatred, whatever it might have been, were trying to diminish his ministry and, and, and actually trying to point him out as being promoting himself. And, and uh, he defended himself in the first letter. In the second letter, it's kind of an interesting thing that he says. And, and I find it interesting. And I, 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 I want to hopefully bring this, uh, make it personal with, it, with each one of us. So Paul writes in the first verse of chapter 3, he says this. Do we begin again to commend ourselves? Or do we need, as some others, epistles of accommodation to you or letters of commendation from you? You are our epistle written in our hearts, known and read by all men. Clearly, you are an epistle of Christ, ministered by us, written not with ink, but by the Spirit of the living God, not on tablets of stone, but on tablets of flesh, that is, of the heart. See, a lot of people, if you go downstairs in the office, you'll see I have a letter of ordination. It's, it's up there. It says that I'm ordained. That was given to me from this, this body. In my wallet, I have a uh, little piece of card that somebody printed out and said that I'm a pastor. So now I can show that, and that's supposed to say something. Anybody could make one. They're not hard to do. It's kind of a, a, something to throw in. But, what, but what's amazing about that, this was given to me, and that was given to me long after I started preaching. It's not the paper, and that's what Paul is saying here. It's not the letters of who we are that makes the difference. In fact, what Paul is saying here, and I think it's interesting, I hope I can bring it out in the way I, I wanted to, he's telling us that I don't need letters of commendation because what I do has been written on my heart and, and, and it's also got not only on my heart, it's on your heart as well. What Paul has done, he's gone out into the world and he's shared the gospel. The only one he's sharing, and he's, he's very uh, constant in every letter that he wrote, that he's writing only about Jesus. Jesus is Lord. Jesus is Savior. Paul's not. Apollos is not. None of the disciples, Peter, none of those guys. It's Jesus. And he never falls away from that and he doesn't uh, he doesn't hide that fact and he doesn't promote himself and, and, and you, you've read in other scriptures uh, where he when he came to a place he always worked he always provided for himself he didn't become a burden to anyone and and uh, but he but he goes on he says I, I love this not written with ink but by the spirit of the living God not on tablets of stone now 
he's referring to something here. And that is the tablets of stone we recognize as where the Ten Commandments came from. Remember Moses went up and, and spent 40 days with God and he got to these tablets. Now I'm going to get this messed up because I didn't go back and read that. But he came down and I can't remember if it was the first time or the second time because he, had, he smashed them once because he came down and saw a golden calf. But, but this time he came down and his face was glowing. Now... I don't want to go too far. I, I, might, I might go ahead of myself a little bit, but you, you guys can bear with me. When, when, when he went up to the mountain, he, he spent time and God gave him these rules, these 10 laws to, to live by. And if you can fulfill these laws and, 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 uh, and don't uh, veer away from them in any way, shape or form, you will have life. That's what it's basically he's telling you. You will have life. God's telling him that. But and, and, and Moses spent all this time up there communing with God. That had to have been awesome. As God's hand wrote out these things on tablets, Moses is there. And he's in the, he's in the presence of God Almighty. And when he comes down, the amazing thing about him was he was a glow. He was a, it was a glow. And it was unbelievable. He was actually emitting the glory of God. I have yet to look in the mirror and see that glow of glory from having spent so much time in the presence of God. But I want that someday. But, but we don't have to be concerned about that. There, there was, there's, there, there's more glory to be had than being in a glow. Uh, but I want to go on here. He says, he says uh, clearly you are an epistle of Christ. The letter is, what he's saying is, each person that has believed in the message that Paul brought to them is inscribed in his heart is the Holy Spirit. And that's the letter. And they can see it because people have changed. The Corinthians have changed. This is a great letter, the second letter, because he commends them in one place of taking care of a situation that was really bad in the first letter. He told them what they ought to do in the second letter. He said, thank you, you did what you were supposed to do. He commended them. They're moving in the right direction. And their lives are a letter to everybody around them that he's not preaching about Paul, he's preaching about Jesus. It's Jesus that changes you, it's the Holy Spirit that changes you. Verse 4 says, And we have such a trust through Christ our God, toward God, not that we are sufficient of ourselves to think of anything as being from ourselves, but our sufficiency is from God. Everything that he has, everything that he offers is from God. He says, there's nothing coming from me. There's nothing coming from me. It, everything I have to offer is from God. Let me fast forward it to today. I have nothing to give you of myself. The only thing I'm here to give you is what I get from this. It comes from God. There is no value, I believe, in anything other than what comes from God. That's where the value is found. That's where life is found. There's no other value. And, and Paul is so good about it. He's so humble. Now, here's a man that is so intelligent that he memorized the first five books for sure, and he probably memorized more of them, and he understood the law inside and out. He understood it. And yet he was able to be humble. He didn't need that recognition, uh, recognition from anybody that he was somebody special. In fact, he denounced it. He didn't want that. He wanted people to see Jesus. And why is that? Is because I'll get to that in a minute why it is. But verse 6 says, and who also made us sufficient as ministers of the new covenant. It's, this new covenant is very important. And I want to read something out of uh, Jeremiah 31, which tells us about this new covenant. Because there is a new covenant, which Paul's telling them, if there's a new covenant, there must be an old covenant. 
But he's not dealing with the old covenant anymore, which is an amazement in and of itself. For anyone that knew Paul, he understood the old covenant. More than anyone else, he understood the Old Covenant. He had it down black and white. He knew it all. But look what it says in Jeremiah, and I love this. Verse 31 says, Behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah, not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day that I took them by the hand and led them out of the land of Egypt. My covenant, which they broke though I was a husband to them, says the Lord. That's a loaded line, isn't it? God's saying, you know, you broke it. I did everything for you, and you broke it. But this, verse 33 says, but this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I will put my law in their minds, and I will, be, and I will write it on their hearts, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. That's that new covenant that he's talking about. He changes our heart. He changes our heart. It's no longer we're reading the tablets, the Ten Commandments, and say, okay, I've got to do this one today. Thou shalt not kill. Okay, I'm not going to go out and kill anybody. And, and you follow these rules, and, and pretty soon by the time you get over to nine, you forgot what number two was, and so you, you're a mess. You can't do it. See, folks, the law was provided for a reason. And there's glory in the reason, as we were going to read. There's glory, but the law was provided to show you what was right and what was wrong. And what it did, it revealed to people at that time, and still does to this day, where we come up short. And that's why we have a problem. Because when we realize we come up short, we then face something that we don't like, which is the punishment for those things that we do wrong. And what is the punishment? Eternal death. And that's a problem. And these people were living in that, under that, that guise that they, they had this, this old covenant that they were walking with and living with, and they were not making it because they couldn't make it, because it's impossible. And you say, well, why would God do that? Because God is God. You don't like that answer, do you? Well, God is God. And it is His design. We aren't in here to make decisions on how we should handle things. He's got it all figured out. And I don't know how far along you've come with the Lord, but I've come to the point in my life where I realize if God had decreased something, if God does something, it's the best thing that could happen ever. And he doesn't waver from that ever. And he says that he made us sufficient as ministers of the new covenant. He, Paul's telling them that he's out there ministering be under the sufficiency of what God gave him. It does come from God. And it says, uh, not of the letter, but of the Spirit. Ah, there's the difference. You go from the law to the Spirit. From the law to the Spirit. For the letter kills, but the Spirit gives life. John 6, 63 says this in one of my favorite verses. It says, it is the Spirit who gives life. The flesh profits nothing. The words that I speak to you are spirit, and they are life. And this is what Paul is saying. Jesus said those words, and Paul's repeating the same thing. It's the things that I'm saying is spirit. It's not law. It's spirit, and it's life. Why? We'll find that out in a minute. Verse 7 says this. I'm going to read 7 through 11. But if the ministry of death written and engraved on stones was glorious so that the children of Israel could not look steadily at the face of Moses because of the glory of his countenance, which glory was passing away, how will the ministry of the Spirit not be more glorious? For if the ministry of condemnation had glory, the ministry of righteousness exceeds much more in glory. For even what was made glorious had no glory in this respect because of the glory that excels. For if what is passing away was glorious, what remains is much more glorious. A lot of glory in those words, isn't there? 
It can, be, it can be a little bit confusing if you're reading it, but let's understand this. There's glory in the commands that God gave his people. There was glory. And it was revealed through Moses when, because of having been with him and taking these, these commandments on, he revealed that glory. But amazingly enough, those people couldn't stand it. And you know why they couldn't stand it, I think? I don't think it was because it was so bright it would hurt their eyes. I think it was a reflection on, it was a condemnation to themselves that they came up short. And no one, no one likes to know that. We don't like that. And some of them probably were envious and thought that they thought Moses was better. And that wasn't the case either. He sinned just like everybody else. Remember, he just got done smashing the first set. But the glory of the old covenant, which was wonderful, has been outshone by the glory of the new covenant because the new covenant is not the letter of the law. It is the Holy Spirit, the Spirit and the Spirit makes all the difference. And so what was glorious before is still glorious, but it, has, it, 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 it pales in comparison to the new covenant, the new, the new way. So verse 12 says this, Therefore, since we have such hope, we use boldness of speech. And see, that's what, that's what Paul does. And he goes out there, he has hope. And what's his hope? His hope is in Jesus Christ. His hope is in the resurrection of Jesus. The hope is in the blood that was poured out for Je from Jesus for us. His hope rely, uh, relies on Jesus who accomplished what no other man could accomplish. And Paul had hope in that. And that hope is real because he knows it's real because what's, what did Jesus do for us? Which was amazing. He gave us his spirit. Remember, he breathed into the disciples when he first saw them and they received the Spirit, and then later the baptism of the Spirit where he empowered them. This is what happens. This is available to each and every one of us. In fact, he's available to each and every one of us. He's the Holy Spirit. He lives in our heart. And because he knew that, I know that, and those here that understand who Jesus is, you know that. You have hope inside you. Julie always says, hope is the anchor. It is, isn't it? It holds you down, not down. It keeps your feet on the ground. You don't go floating around, looking around anywhere. You've got your hope. You're, 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 uh, it's engraved into your heart that Jesus Christ is Lord and, and, and Savior of your life. And that's that hope. Paul had it. So he was bold about it because he knew it. And what happened while Paul was walking around and sharing the gospel he was watching people's lives change. And that's where their hard stone hearts were becoming as flesh. And the law was removed and the spirit was replaced in their hearts. And that was, the, that was his epistle. That's why he said, just look behind me and see the people that I've already talked with that have taken in on themselves to believe what I say and their lives are changed. That's where we see whether you are, uh, need any commendation or not, your commendation is what you see, what your fruit is. Your fruit is, is what, what explains who you are. And so I hope that each one of you look around and see what your lives reflect and, 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 and what you've uh, produced. Because if you have fruit around from the things you've done, you know that you're walking with the Lord. And you don't have to have a, a, a certificate signed by me saying, okay, today you can go out and share Jesus. You have my permission. That means nothing. You have the Holy Spirit within you. Let him out. Now it says in verse 12, Therefore, since we have such hope, we use boldness, great boldness of speech. Unlike Moses, who put a veil over his face so that the children of Israel could not look steadily at the end of what was passing away. That's amazing. It was even, he knew it was diminishing, but they couldn't take it. They couldn't take it. But their minds were blinded. For until this day, the same veil remains unlifted in the reading of the Old Testament because the veil is taken away in Christ. Now, I want to explain something. 
When you read the Old Testament, don't think the veil is on reading it. What he's saying is the men and people that stuck in the Old Testament and they couldn't move on to Christ. They couldn't believe that there was a Messiah. They couldn't believe that he came. They couldn't believe that. They are stuck in the Old. They're still waiting for something and it already happened. It's like, it's like going home some night and, and I'm waiting for supper in my chair and my wife places it on the table and when she's all done and everybody's done, she picks it up and puts it away and I'm saying, where's my supper? Well, it was right here. But I didn't make myself avail available to it. So it was not there. And, 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 in, and these people, there's so many people in this world today that don't avail themselves to the promises that are found right in this word. And why is that? Because their minds are blinded. Their minds are blinded by, they're consumed. Now remember, Jesus took up residence in our heart. But who takes up residence in our mind? That's where the enemy attacks, doesn't he? So if you let him stick around, he's going to change you and he's going to blind you. So you cannot see that which is right in front of you. But if you allow the Lord to start to work, the scales come off your eyes and you see. There's many times, still in this world today, there's many that, that just depend on the Old Testament or no Testament at all. They believe Old Testament just means Old Covenant and they believe in that still. And they're working and striving and striving and working in and it's like spin tires in the mud. You're just not going to go anywhere. But even to this day, when Moses is ready, veil lies on their heart. Nevertheless, when one turns to the Lord, the veil is taken away. See how simple it is. God is so kind and merciful to us. He doesn't make it difficult. We don't have to jump through hoops. We don't have to fulfill 19 steps along the way before we get to such and such a place. It just says, when we turn to the Lord. And what does that mean? It means when we turn away from us being in charge and we turn to the Lord to make him in charge. That's all it is. It's a turning, a turning, and it's a 180. Some people say, I did a 360. Well, then you're in the same spot again. You do a 180 and you walk away from where you were and you walk toward the Lord. And it says, uh, nevertheless, the one, when one turns to the Lord, the veil is taken away. And that's out of the kindness and the mercy and the goodness of God that that veil is pulled away. It indicated back when he was crucified, when the veil was torn from the top down. That was the beginning of the veil being pulled away. And I told you that's a couple weeks ago. Maybe this is what I was talking about a couple weeks ago. Because remember, I said that the pre, they, I looked on, on the internet and, it, and they said there were priests that tried to put that veil back together. <laughs> wow. That'd be quite a needle to put that baby that together. Anyway, nevertheless, when one turns, away the, turns to the Lord, the veil is taken away. Now the Lord is spirit. Very important to understand that. The Lord is spirit. The Lord is Jesus. The Lord is God. He's God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. And we need to make sure that we understand that because remember, he lives in our hearts. And I often think if we got up in the morning and we reminded ourselves that Jesus is right here, how would our day go differently? Sometimes because he's hidden there and he's so kind and gentle, he doesn't jump out. And so you can go off and do whatever it is that you want to do. But he's right here. He says, now where the Lord is a spirit, now the Lord is a spirit, and where the spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty, there is freedom. Now, I want to be very careful that you don't misconstrue what that liberty means. Because it doesn't mean that you can tromp all over everybody or do anything that you want to do. Okay? 
But Galatians 5, 1 says this, Stand fast, therefore, in the liberty by which Christ has made us free, and do not be entangled again with a yoke of bondage. So when you understand that the Holy Spirit resides in you, take a look at what is going on in your world. Make sure that you don't fall back in the traps. And believe me, the enemy is going to try to trap you and set you up for a fall here, a fall there, whatever it might be. He's doing it all the time. But understand that you can remain free because of what Jesus has done for us. And he goes on and says in verse uh, 13, for you, brethren, have been called to liberty. Only do not use liberty as an opportunity for the flesh, but through love serve one another. Now that probably destroys some people's ideas because I want to be served. I deserve to be served. Why do I have to serve somebody? I'm special. And we all smile and laugh, and I understand that. But it's true. Stop and think about it. There are times in your lives, certain parts of the day, whatever it might be, that, no, wait a minute, I want to be served. And we're not here to be served. Jesus didn't come to be served. Jesus came to serve. And all we're supposed to do exact, is exactly what he did, serve others, to love on others. Now the Lord is a spirit, and where the spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. But we all, with unveiled face, beholding as in the mirror the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image from glory to glory, just as by the spirit of the Lord. I love this part. We can, we can look at our lives, and we can look, I, can, I can look at lives of people that are here on our, all the time, and, and, and it's amazing to me, but we, I see changes in people. I've seen growth in people. And you know where the growth, most of the growth, growth comes from that I see? is in the people that are going through very hard times, and yet they have taken it upon themselves to walk with the Lord. They grow. You see it. You see their change. It's amazing the number of people that have struggles and hardship in their lives, and yet they're out taking care of other people. They're doing other things for other people. They're pouring out for the others. You see that. And we can look in our own mirror at home, and by, by saying a mirror, I don't mean standing in front of a mirror, but I mean you can do an inventory of who you are, where you've come. You know where you were a year ago, two years ago, 20 years ago, 50 years ago. You know where you were. And you see the transforming? We started in glory when we accepted Jesus. We're going to end up in glory when we're face to face. But that whole transition, the whole time, is transforming us into his image, not the image that we were only better, but we're getting rid of the old man and we're putting on the new. And he's doing that by the Spirit. Verse, four, or verse 1 of chapter 4 says, Therefore, since we have this ministry, we have, as we have received mercy, we do not lose heart. And if you jump over to verse 16 there in chapter 4, it says, Therefore we do not lose heart. Even, even though our outward man is perishing, yet the inward man is being renewed day by day. I really wanted to get to this part. I know I'm probably the only one in this place, but I'm getting older. Certain things are starting to fall apart. But I'm not, and this is not boastful by any stretch of the imagination. I don't want it to sound that way, but I want you to understand what that's just said. But my life is getting stronger and stronger in Jesus. My relationship with him is getting better. It's getting better because I'm spending more time with him. And I'm doing the things he's called me to do when he calls me to do them. 
And I'm not doing the things he hasn't called me to do just because somebody else wants me to do them. I'm doing what Jesus calls me to do. And, and, and so it's an encouragement to each one of us. As our bodies start to fall apart and as the snow falls onto our roof, we can still understand we have a lot to offer. So I think, and, 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 and we were talking about Solomon this morning, and I, Solomon to me is a, is a, is a I, I have questions of whether he's actually in heaven or not. I don't know. And, and, and maybe nobody knows and we'll never figure that out until we get there. Because what happens if you read scripture, he was right on, wasn't he? He was right on doing the things God wanted him to do, built the temple, wrote these proverbs that are amazing, wrote these other things, and then he got to uh, Ecclesiastes, and then he was kind of like out there a little bit. But, it, but it's, it's good stuff, I'm not saying that, but it's strange how he kind of just uh, matures in a certain way. But it says in the end of the times that he, he, was, he fought, fell away and fouled all the gods as he got older. Did he get tired? Was he wore out? Was he feeling just blah? I don't know. But what I do want to tell you folks is this. As you get older, don't ever think that you're importance in the kingdom of God is diminished because it is not. It's important for you to understand that what you have before you is wonderful work to be done, that you can invest in your family, that you can invest in those around you, that you have something to give. And what is it that you give? It's easy. It's very simple. It's this ministry that we're giving. We've been given a ministry, a ministry of sharing the gospel. And how do we do that? Like Dave says, with everything we do, and then if we have to, we can use words, right? Every expression that you do should be something that opens up somebody's eyes to Jesus. How you treat one another, how you treat yourself, how you walk. How you talk, what you do is so very, very vitally important in the kingdom. So as you get older and as you don't feel like you can do anything, don't fall into that trap. That is a lie. I believe we are vital. And in fact, I got in, this, in the, my front of my Bible, a man in the center of God's will is immortal till God's done with him. And I believe that's true. So don't stop serving God. Don't think that all of a sudden I don't have anything anymore. We do have something. And I truly believe, and this is going out on a limb for some of you folks, you probably think I'm nuts, but I truly believe that this congregation is it's going to be filled up. This place is going to be filled up with people because we, there's the, the world outside needs Jesus. And if we don't stop, if we don't become weary, if we don't change courses, if we stay, the, the stay on course as to what we're supposed to be doing, we can make a difference in this area to fill this place up with younger people that need to know Jesus. Because there still is no other answer. 2,000 years have gone by since Jesus uh, sacrificed himself on the cross. And in 2,000 years, no one has come up with a better plan. And I guarantee in another 2,000 years, there will be not a better plan. There was only one good plan to begin with. It's been from the beginning, and it is Jesus Christ. And we need to understand and, and realize that we have that responsibility and that great joy of sharing the gospel wherever we go, in word and in deed. But even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing. We, and, and that's just a, a little warning. There's some people that you're going to talk to, there's, you, you don't see any change. They're just not getting it. Understand that. But your job is not to change them. Watch this, I'll, I'll get to that. Who's my, where did I see that? 
We just read in verse 18, we are being transformed just as by the Spirit of the Lord. And that's another thing that I, that I, little bone of contention I have sometimes, I get frustrated with. People think that they need to go out and change somebody. I know people that are living together right now that I know I can change him. I know I can change her. No, you can't. You can't. Not one person can ever change another person. They can influence them, but they cannot change them. The only one that can change anyone is the Holy Spirit. I didn't come to the Lord because my mom prayed for me. I came to the Lord because my mom prayed for me and the Holy Spirit revealed himself to me and I accepted him. It's the Holy Spirit that does the work. So when you get somebody that you really desperately love and you just want to shake them because they're just not seeing the light, well, they'll see the light if you hit them hard enough. They'll see some light, so some for them. But, but be careful. Understand your job is just to love on them, pray for them, and let the Holy Spirit change them. But they're going to see it more not from what you say, but it's from how you do, how you act. Love is so loud it's silent, or so silent that it's loud. One way, I don't care how you want to look at it, but love is something that just, it, it, it pours into somebody and they see it and it's, it's palatable to them and they, and they can taste it and they can feel it. And that's what's attractive. That's why Jesus said, love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. It's the love that makes the change. Because the love, the source of love is God, the Holy Spirit. And he's the one that comes in and changes. But even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing, whose minds the God of this age has blinded, who do not believe, lest the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine on them. For we do not preach ourselves. And that's like, that's like me going home and telling my kids, you got to start acting like me. That would be the worst thing in the world to say. <laughs> but you see, when I say, Paul's saying, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not preaching about me. And we don't have to preach about me, but Christ Jesus the Lord and ourselves, your bondservants, for Jesus' sake. Right there, he, he puts God at, at the top. Loving the Lord God with all his heart, soul, mind, and strength, and loving neighbors. And that's what he's doing right there. But verse 6 says something that's kind of interesting. For it is the God who commanded light to shine out of darkness, who has shone in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus. First of all, isn't it so interesting? I had to go back and read Genesis 1. Sometimes we, we know something so much that we forget. <laughs> so I'm going back there. And what's the first thing that God, that God did? He divided light from dark. Remember, everything was dark. And he divided and he said, let there be light. But it wasn't until four days before he made the sun and the moon and the stars. So what's this light you're talking about? What is that? It's, I believe, is the presence of God himself. He is light. Jesus said, I am light. I am the light of the world. It's Jesus. And he, he was there. And it was he that brought in the light. And it's that light that is in our hearts. And it's that light that shines out of our hearts. And it's that light that's going to change those around us. It's not us. It's the light that we shine. It's the light that we reflect. When we look unto Jesus and walk with him, it's that light we reflect that draws them in. People are like moths for light. They want that light. They're dying for that light. They're starving for that light. We need to shine that light. And that light is not our light. That light is God. 
We can't take credit for it. Paul couldn't take credit for it. We can't take credit for it. It's God. Isn't it awesome that we have a God that loves us so much that he's got all the bases covered? All we have to do is receive his glory and allow it to flow through us. And we will change lives around us and we will come closer. We will draw closer and closer to him. I don't know where else would he want to be other than in the presence of Jesus Christ. There's no one, there's nothing else out there that will give us the love, the joy, the peace that comes from knowing Jesus. Amen. So Father God, I thank you for your word. I, I thank you, Lord God, for the encouragement in your word to know that it's not us that makes the changes in people, it's you, Lord, and that you've just called us and we've called each and every one of us. There's no one special here. There's no letters of commendation. There's no uh, plaques on the wall that say and so and so is more special or whatever. Lord, it's you and it's all about you. And you allow us to share your wonderful gospel with everybody that we come in contact with. And I thank you, Lord God, for that opportunity. And I pray, God, for this congregation and for those that watch that, that we would recognize who you are truly in our lives. And we would recognize that there's no greater joy than to share your love with everyone around us. I pray, Lord God, for a great blessing on these people today. I thank you, Lord, for all the many blessings that you give us, especially this beautiful earth that you allow us to live on. And God, I just, I just thank you. Help us, Lord God, to walk closely with you, to show the world who you are by everything that we say and more importantly, by everything that we do. In Jesus' name. friend